very, very late hour, um, but grateful to have you here with us. So I'm going to hand it over to you and Lincoln, feel free to share your screen if there are any slides that you want to go over. Sure. Thanks, Dan, and thanks, everyone, for your time. Um, yeah, it's great to see everyone. I'm going to attempt to share my slides, and let's hope this works smoothly. Let's just give me one second. So I hope this is working. Uh, maybe if someone can confirm. It's, the it's looking good. Thanks, Lincoln. Okay, good. Great. All right. So uh, I'm going to try to make this as quick as possible. But uh, I was just sharing with Dan after I saw the invitation to the uh, to the specific meeting. Uh, some of the things that we've been trying to do quickly at ICM. We definitely are not um, doing everything that we want to be doing. But maybe we thought sharing a piece of the actions that we've been taking. I love how you put it as offense and defense. Um, I think we're trying to be as effective as possible in some of our responses. Uh, hopefully some of the ideas that, we've, um, that we can share today, uh, we would love to get comments to improve them, but maybe it can also help uh, inspire and spark some ideas amongst our colleagues here. So I'll jump right into it. Uh, so here in the Philippines, um, as I'm sure is similar to a lot of other countries, uh, we are in a rush to try to respond to COVID-19. And one thing we saw, uh, this is a little bit older, was the Department of Health here put together, put together an algorithm to try to sift through patients and to figure out who is severe, uh, who needs testing, who doesn't need testing, so on and so forth. And we found really quickly that these kind of algorithms, uh, while it might make a lot of sense technically, is really difficult to get through, uh, especially for the participants that we work with, people in the villages that we communicate with. It's tough to get through this. So, uh, someone in our team quickly put together a Facebook chatbot. And the way the chatbot uh, functions is it will guide a person or a responder through this algorithm and through a series of yes and no's and through a series of logic statements that we put in the back of the chatbot, it guides people through the system. And then hopefully we can give them advice depending on the, the status of their symptoms. And this is one of our attempts to help declaw uh, tertiary health care, primary health care in some of the hospitals here. Uh, to be honest with everyone here, this was one of the first times we've attempted a chatbot. We found it way easier to build than we expected. So uh, the person who put it together is not from a computer science background, and uh, we were still able to figure it out. So uh, we found that this technology was really interesting. So here's what the screen looks like. And uh, when you interact with the chatbot, what it does is, uh, this is the sample that I went through when we were testing the bot. It'll just talk to me. Uh, we put in four different languages, so we translated it very quickly, uh, the information we wanted to go through, and then it'll just talk to me. Uh, and so instead of maybe just information on a page, uh, what this does is it has this conversation with the respondent. And this type of data collection uh, was really cool because it also gives us the opportunity to interact with respondents, which I'll show a little bit later. So as this rolled out, we also started to see an unfolding situation here in the Philippines. And it might be similar in some of the other lower and middle income countries that we work in. Uh, and that was this issue with food security. So we have quite stringent measures in place right now in the Philippines. And I think one of the, one of the unintended consequences, especially for marginalized communities, is we are seeing a uptick in hunger and we are worried that malnutrition is gonna be quite rampant in some of the communities that we work in. So what we did was we were able to then tag food security questions onto the end of this chat bot. And uh, here's just some of the data that we've been gathering. We've had this bot up for maybe two weeks and we are at uh, over 3,700 respondents, which we find uh, quite encouraging. And we're gonna keep pushing the bot out by uh, sending the link to a lot of our uh, a lot of our participants. Uh, but here is the food security section. And um, as you can see, actually there, in a lot of the respondents, they were saying that there isn't a problem with food security. Uh, today was the last day that they had a meal. Uh, but you'll see that we found in about two and a half percent of people, uh, they haven't had a meal in five, six, seven days. And then another two and a half, 
up to 3% of our respondents haven't had a meal for two, three, or four days. And uh, altogether, this is over 5% of our population or of our respondents are telling us uh, there's food issues. So uh, we then weave this into our response plan. So with the intervention of the operations team in ICM, and this is how we are starting to organize uh, the relief operations that we're doing. We, we actually have another stream of data that comes in to tell us uh, which areas and which cities might need. Uh, we need food uh, support, but we felt that now we have an additional stream of data uh, to come in and uh, it's just a great way for us to almost live monitor which areas are in need and um, to update the places that we need to distribute food. So the rest of this is not too complicated. It's just a series of linked Google Sheets and it gives us the ability to, um, to track in the different provinces that we work in in the Philippines, uh, the number of families in need, uh, and then when we deliver food packs, uh, how many are delivered. Uh, so I thought this might be just a great example we could share quickly on how um, we felt that it's been quite successful to set up a quick bot to talk to the participants and then have that information feed into our relief operations so that we can really target the places that are in most need. So that's one example of how we've been uh, repurposing our evaluation team. Uh, pretty much everyone's been working on different projects, but uh, we placed everyone onto COVID work in the last few weeks to get some of these things to work. There's a few other things that we did that I thought I'd also quickly go over. Uh, one thing we also added was knowledge, attitudes, and practice questions. Uh, we found that these questions were used after the 2009 pandemic with the uh, H1N1 flu and also after SARS and some questions that were used um, after Ebola. And uh, it turned out that for us, it was quite timely. We were able to weave some of these questions in quickly into the regular surveys that we conduct. The red line here on the figure is the number of cases in the Philippines. So really it is our contact context and we were able to survey right before the uptick in cases and uh, what we then got was data that showed us uh, even before that that surge in cases the large majority of the people we work with have heard of the virus uh, you'll see 94 percent of them say that we then asked about routes of transmission whether they recognize different routes of transmission and then whether they worry about COVID-19 and how it has affected their lives and so just we were able to do some quick analysis that isn't too complicated and we were able to see that uh, it looks like uh, that the knowledge that people have around the modes of transmission or their attitudes whether they're worried about the virus or their lives have been disrupted uh, seems to be correlated to the preventive measures that they're willing to take and this uh, finding for us is helpful because we do want to be doing more health information and health communication during this time uh, and findings like this help us justify that working on the knowledge uh, and the attitudes part uh, really seems to be linked to the practices that people might take to prevent uh, COVID transmission. And then the last thing is, I, I feel like for us, we've also repurposed part of our team to do evaluation of data from our own country, so the Philippines. We're seeing lots of researchers working on data from uh, places like the US, the UK, um, and in Hong Kong and China, but I think some of these lower middle income countries, uh, it might be good also to lend a hand if we can. So uh, we've been able to quickly do some things online uh, to try to maybe uh, give another perspective to policymakers here in the country to talk about how in lower middle income countries, um, there are un un unintended effects to, to strict quarantine measures. And uh, just one of the figures that we thought were, was quite important for us uh, the red line here is the number of cases in the Philippines, and you'll see that it exponentially increased after March 15th, and that's when the strict measures came in. Uh, but we are we wanted to point out that the number of patients being tested here also exponentially increased at the exact same time period. Uh, so we just want the policymakers to take a step back and think about how um, this peak might not be um, exactly true and how the testing capacity in these countries really linked to it. So I know that was a mouthful. Uh, I tried to really go through everything um, quickly, but uh, because I'm excited to hear about what everyone else is doing, but um, I thought, hope that this is just three different things that we've been able to pull off quickly. Um, very thankful for the team that we have here. Um, but just to summarize, we found that these chatbots, these interactive methods have been really great 
they're a lot easier to set up than we um, KAP surveys have been really helpful for us, uh, being able to implement it quickly and in a timely way, and hopefully the findings are useful. Uh, and then also thinking about what can we do as an organization that's in a country that might not have as much resources. Uh, if we can weigh in and help with analysis, we love to do the best we can. So um, I hope that's helpful. And um, thank you, Dan, for giving us the chance to share. Yeah, thanks, Lincoln, for, the, for sharing. I know you just summarized a lot of information in a very short time. So thank you for doing that. Um, just as a FYI for the rest of the participants, in case you missed it in the chat, but Stacy mentioned this, that we are, we are recording this. Um, I, I hope that's not too belated for anybody that uh, is now concerned that they're on video. Uh, but again, no shame in our game here today. Um, so um, yeah, I'd love to open the, the floor for any questions for, for Lincoln about some of the uh, ideas that, that ICM has been implementing. Hi, this is Dawn from Episcopal Relief and Development. Thanks, uh, Lincoln. That was really a very interesting and impressive um, amount of work that you've done. My question is on the survey mechanism with your participants. Were those, was that mobile data collection or how was that done? Yeah, so the, the initial survey data was done in person, and that was before any of the measures were put in place and we had any, um, well, and, and before we had reported local transmission here. I think we are um, now looking at different ways of collecting data. And Facebook Messenger for us, it, and this might be unique to the Philippines, um, data plans here, or even no data plans, include a free version of Facebook Messenger. So we decided to pick the, the free, the cheapest, the most widely used method of communication. Uh, so from now on, we, we think we are going to be collecting data through, through that method. And uh, it might be very similar to the, the chatbot that I was sharing about. And it might, we, we're gonna try to walk people through a series of questions that have logic and skip. <coughs> but um, it, it might be different for every country. We just found that we wanted to use the one that's the most widely used. Great. Well, um, if you have questions that come up, feel free to continue to pose them to Lincoln, but uh, I'd love to continue the conversation to hear from other organizations that have been repurposing their meal activities uh, to, to be a part of the, the response in this crisis. And uh, one uh, other member of the hub that has uh, been willing to share was uh, Ahmed Abubakrin from Islamic Relief USA. And so uh, I'd love to invite you and your team to share a little bit about how you are responding in this, in these different times. Thank you, Dan, uh, for your uh, facilitation. And thank you, Lincoln, for your brilliant presentation. I put a question for you in the chat. Maybe after you can look at it and give us some uh, clarification. And uh, to give um, a little bit of uh, background, we at Islamic Relief USA have a program um, in U.S. and international. Our U.S. program include domestic intervention and disaster relief. And international program operate through uh, Islamic Relief worldwide in 40 countries in Africa, MENA region, Asia, Eastern Europe, and Latin, Latin America. Uh, currently, we have about 200 projects. Uh, worth uh, 85 million. And this is important when we'll talk about uh, the repurposing. Uh, and we are serving uh, as a main funding entity for uh, Islamic Relief Worldwide. Uh, like all of you, uh, COVID-19 has really impacted us uh, greatly. And we have uh, kind of shifted part of our programming to our uh, responding to the crisis. Uh, so far, we have 2.5 
2.4 million uh, domestically uh, commitment domestically and 2.7 million for international uh, project and we keep counting so uh, we have committed new resources and repurpose existing one uh, in the first week it was more of 70% uh, offense and 30% uh, defense but I think we are balancing now we will, we will more or, or less come to 50-50 uh, and I will let my colleague Nurullah give you some uh, who is leading this change to elaborate more on, on some of them. Uh, thank you, Abu Bakrin. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, since uh, people are from different parts of the world on this call. I hope everyone is uh, doing well and uh, along with your families. Um, so um, as we are um, moving toward uh, through this whole pandemic, every one of us uh, globally, uh, so every organization is facing challenges and issues, how to give response and, and how to repurpose and, and particularly the meal activities has been drastically affected um, around uh, this uh, pandemic. Uh, so I, would, I would like to go through a couple of things um, and uh, uh, we'll touch on, uh, of course, the repurposing part and also the uh, instruments that we are changing or using uh, right now in this situation. So due to the lockdown, uh, major development projects activities uh, at, in IR USA uh, have been almost halted and major focus is on emergency and humanitarian response to the crisis. Uh, we have repositioned some of our staff to provide direct support to our frontline team in delivery of relief uh, services. Uh, and these services are mostly like food security related projects um, and particularly our assistance within the United States that we are giving to different community-based organizations, uh, distribution of hygiene kits and uh, cash assistance related uh, type of interventions. Um, and under the international program, uh, we are repurposing um, some of the grants to address uh, the COVID-19 uh, needs because the development uh, projects right now are um, almost like uh, stopped uh, because they cannot do implementation. So we are working with our partners globally that how uh, we could uh, support the um, uh, projects that are giving response to COVID-19. Uh, and uh, in the meantime, um, we are also in discussion with the, our partners, um, particularly Islamic Relief Worldwide, which is our major implementing partner in our international programs, um, discussing uh, on the meal engagement strategy, uh, because uh, everyone, every organization is uh, refocusing their meal, meal intervention. Uh, so we are right now in discussion. So we do not have yet a clear strategy finalized, but hopefully in coming days and weeks, we will have a clear uh, direction on uh, uh, meal activities on the ground. Uh, and uh, also um, you know, we are utilizing our meal teams on uh, um, helping uh, the due diligence and wedding process here at the headquarter level so that how we make ensure that whatever we can do at the headquarter level so that it can give support to the uh, meal uh, work uh, at the agency level. And additionally, mm, uh, on the uh, meal instruments, um, so uh, currently uh, we, mm, we're focusing on a couple of things. Um, so we do not have uh, any a clear um, instruments that has that can help every organization or could be piloted or, or, or shared with others. But some of the steps that we have taken that could be of help and that what we have, uh, we have been using. Um, first, uh, our meal team plays a critical role in informing decision making. Uh, in this crisis, we advise our executives on uh, how relevance um, these programs or intervention are that could um, cover the COVID-19 scope, uh, alignment and feasibility of many proposals uh, that how um, that can help our uh, intervention that has been submitted uh, by our partners or, 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 or potential uh, new um, uh, donors so that how we can um, assist our executives that they can 
um, understand the uh, the scope of this um, these uh, proposals. Uh, the other part of our intervention is completing meal studies uh, under the COVID-19. Uh, we have started uh, major evaluation studies uh, that are yet to be completed, but it is very important. Uh, it is very difficult for IRUSA to conduct field missions for these studies uh, because we have been on, ev like everyone in the United States has been uh, uh, working from home, so we are not able to go to the field to do uh, these studies, but we are piloting a remote monitoring and evaluation of one of our projects that we have supported in uh, Texas, Houston. Um, we have done our internal um, uh, uh, meetings and virtual meetings and, and data collection, um, and now we are starting, hopefully, this next week, uh, reaching out to our other stakeholders, the external stakeholders, the donor, and uh, some of the mm, partners that were involved in the implementation of this uh, project. So we would like to uh, collect uh, data and information from them as well. Um, it is the first experience for us as well that we are piloting, and we will learn. Uh, we will learn the issues and challenges and and how it help how it will be helpful for us uh, moving forward. Um, but I think that's the, the only way that we can proceed uh, right now. In uh, second project, that is a global project. We are also, um, I was uh, having a discussion with the consultant that who is uh, doing uh, uh, one study of uh, our or orphan support to uh, various countries. So a consultant has been hired in, uh, through our partner Islamic Relief Worldwide and he's conducting um, a study. So we are engaged closely with him as well on, on uh, data collection on orphan uh, study. And um, we will be uh, executing this uh, study uh, interventions in, in coming days, not coming days, even next week. So I have, we have scheduled a couple of uh, calls and, and talking to people so that how this works. So hopefully that uh, can give us uh, another we that how we can uh, do um, uh, monitoring uh, and evaluation of projects that are of uh, global uh, nature uh, apart from our u.s intervention uh, we and the sec the the third part is our um, uh, changing in our uh, information gathering methods uh, since um, situations are evolving um, uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. So the first thing and which is very helpful here in the US or many other developed uh, countries, um, going fully digital, uh, which, is, which is a great advantage that we are having. Uh, in the context of the US, technology is very helpful as it enables us to shift towards online data collection um, meetings, focus groups in key informants interviews for ongoing meal activities. That has been very helpful. Internally, we have also shifted to virtual consultations. Um, uh, the example that I shared with you earlier is about the Houston project that we are currently right now um, doing the uh, evaluation. Uh, so eventually we will be moving towards more uh, that type of uh, evaluations within the US particularly, but the international, we are still working on a strategy that how we can um, find out uh, detailed solution for that. Uh, the second part of this um, uh, information gathering is uh, harmonizing remote supervision and monitoring. Uh, we are preparing a session on how to set the same approach across the organization in terms of regular monitoring and supervision of our portfolio um, which is which Abu Bakr mentioned is $85 million. Uh, we are collecting data virtually and compiling the results. Uh, we will be piloting the remote monitoring of some of the US programs in uh, coming weeks. Uh, so it may be complicated, but a step into the right direction. Uh, and also additionally, we are putting measures that on uh, post monitoring and evaluation, um, uh, we have made our meal requirement simpler um, to speed up the delivery of our relief assistance. Uh, however, we have informed our partners and grantees that there will be a series of post-monitoring and evaluation checks 
for the sake of both accountability and learning. Once things get better and improve so that we are able to travel to the field, so maybe at that stage we can look for that long-term um, uh, uh, learning and, and, and of course the accountability part of the grants that we are supporting. Now coming to the last part, repurposing, um, which is a, a critical part um, in every organization. Um, since we already um, uh, allocated uh, funds in, uh, to various projects, so there, there was a, a discussion that how we can repurpose some of the grants to uh, COVID-19 if the projects are not started and, and, and those development interventions are not happening right now, but those could start maybe at later stage and then we can contribute uh, whatever commitment has been done. Mm, so uh, the, the, the meal data being leveraged in, our, uh, in, a, way, in a news ways to that uh, report on our relief needs, we took a couple of steps. Number one, bridging and data integration is the key part of this um, repurposing. We have uh, developed internal data management tool that are specifically for COVID-19 response uh, projects to ensure that on agency level, we have unified data and are accessible to all staff. Uh, so uh, we develop tool, uh, it's very simple, it's spreadsheet. So that captures uh, data across the agency, the US program, international programs, uh, and a very detailed level uh, data points are captured in that. Uh, every staff member in the organization has access to those information so that what is going on in, in, in at the agency level. And then we provide a regular analysis to different um, stakeholders internally. Uh, that helps a lot to us in terms of uh, making decisions and repurposing our um, assistance to both the US and, and international. Um, and the, the second part of this uh, repurposing is um, uh, communicate, uh, leveraging a, to communicate with beneficiaries. Um, we have a good network of partners, 200 plus partners, um, to design tailor-made response to COVID-19 according to uh, the context in which they are operating. Uh, so. Um, every organization or, or grantee that are working um, uh, in their communities or in, 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 in particular countries, uh, the situation in context is quite different from one scenario to another. So we have that leverage of number one, uh, the network that can give us more information in, in, in ways and tools that how uh, different countries or different grantees in different environment that are operating that could help us in, in in more detail thinking about uh, our support and assistance to uh, COVID-19 response and particularly in our internal um, repurposing uh, decision making. Um, and uh, the last part of to make it is uh, IRUC and its partners do have staff on the ground. Uh, we are working closely with all of them to document evidence from the field using testimonies, photos and videos. We are ensuring quality um, somehow through using program in uh, fund development and marketing stuff uh, is a triangulation source, um, but still it is a very minimal intervention through our, those uh, program in fund development and marketing teams, um, but it at least the steps that we have uh, initiated. And we are also revitalizing our hotline and feedback mechanisms in collaboration with our compliance and safeguard desks that uh, can give us an, a, a, another uh, layer of information that can help us in terms of uh, thinking in uh, repurposing our grants. Mm, so that's from my side. If there is any question, I will re respond to a colleague. Yeah, thanks, Nurullah, and thanks, Abu Bakreen, for, for sharing from your experience. Uh, one of the things that, that stood out to me from what you shared was that that balance of uh, help reducing perhaps on the front end some of the M&E expectations to allow for a quick response, but still having a strong accountability and learning the back end. Um, uh, I, I, that really stuck out to me. But yeah, I'll open the, the floor if there are, are, are questions from what Abu Bakrin and Narula have shared.
Well, feel free to, to chat your questions either uh, to the whole group or, or separately to Abubakrin and Nurula if you have follow-up questions. But thank you so much for, for sharing. Oh, yes, Dawn. Me again. Yes, uh, me again. Um, Nurula, could you give us a specific example? Uh, uh, you mentioned a piloting remote supervision and monitoring. Could you give us a specific example of the how of that, of a pilot, in, not in the US, but in one of your um, other countries where you have projects? Yes, um, uh, IRUC has a, a very unique um, situation. We are a donor and we are also doing uh, implementation. So in our international interventions, um, we are implementing our projects through um, mostly Islamic Relief Worldwide, uh, but we have some other partners as well. Um, we, IRUSA does not have any staff on the ground uh, internationally. So we're working with our um, partners. Uh, one of the um, approach that we are working with the um, IRW on a strategy that, uh, uh, how to make sure that we ensure that the project activities on the ground are happening um, is, uh, uh, utilizing those uh, local resources that are um, available at the projects level. Um, either the project teams that are doing uh, um, humanitarian emergency response activities, they do through the staff members or, or, or individuals who are do, taking the lead on the monitoring work, and then they report back to the IRW headquarters, and, and that's how we get the, uh, the feedback and, and data. Um, but still, uh, IRW is working on a um, global strategy of their monitoring and evaluation specifically for COVID-19, uh, which has been not fi finalized yet. Uh, is it finalized? They will be sharing with us so that how we can align ourselves with that strategy. Abu Bakrin, if you want to add anything. Yeah, uh, uh, Nurullah mentioned that we are preparing a session to kind of harmonize our practices because now everybody in the organization is doing it her own or his own way. And uh, we, we are sure there are good practices. Some people are using, you know, Skyping uh, interview and we want to harmonize in a way that, okay, uh, are we going to reach out to our uh, field staff only or are we going to reach out the beneficiary and talk to them online? Or are we going, you know, what's the level of involvement uh, we have to adopt? You know, we have some people who are directly connected through WhatsApp with their uh, villages in Kenya, in Somali, and, and they get some information, some pictures, some video. We have some people who rely on just documents from uh, the, the field offices. So uh, our aim here in uh, USA is that to get the uh, people together as soon as tomorrow, we, uh, we have a session to discuss what would be the best practice and harmonize across the organization and agree with uh, Islamic Relief Worldwide that this is the way to do now. Of course, I, I want to reiterate that our philosophy now is make the requirements simpler, but signal that this is no, no way a way to reduce our level of accountability or learning requirement. It's just we are postponing it after the fact. Thank you. I have a question, Dan. Yes, please. Colonial from the Christian Journal for Global Health. Um, my question is, uh, for Abu Bakrin, if, if Islamic Relief, uh, you said that some of your uh, development projects are put on hold because of the COVID-19 crisis. I'm wondering if uh, you see this as an opportunity to, uh, to improve your M&E uh, outputs and uh, inter interventions uh, and sort of retool the organization so that then can be utilized in other areas and fields of development uh, in the future uh, as, an, as an opportunity? Uh, uh, it's, uh, thank you for the question. It's uh, unfortunately uh, not something I would consider uh, an opportunity because it means that uh, a lot of services we are rendering, especially microfinance and livelihood services are stopped because of uh, the country's uh, uh, decision to lock down or to stop the activity and to do the social distancing. Uh, we see that more of uh, as, as, as an opportunity uh, in terms of 
repurposing some of the fund. So we, we, we our our board has given a, 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 our program director the ability to approve immediately without any consultation, any change to utilize some of this fund uh, from the development project to respond to the COVID-19 in terms of food security and provision of PPE. So, so that's an opportunity because instead of having our staff sitting idle, we, we engage them into the relief. And that includes also our m and &E staff. Uh, Nurullah mentioned that one of the, one of the, 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 the defense uh, 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 mitigation we are doing is that we are allowing our m and &E people now to give hands-on support to the people on the ground. And, and we are doing it both in US and internationally. So, so this is what we are envisaging now. We don't know how long it will take or uh, what, what is the level of repurposing we are discussing. Are we going to allow up to 50% of resource of this development project? These questions are being discussed and we are looking for area to make a, a decision across the organization because of the need of resources, especially in, in country that are highly uh, affected by, by the crisis. Thank you. Thank you for those questions. Continue to send those via the chat. Um, as, as our time is running, I, I did want to uh, move us on and I wanted to invite Claire Hagens from Catholic Relief Services. Um, she has, uh, she and her organization have been working on some uh, very practical meal guidelines that uh, I, she's going to be sharing with us afterwards, but wanted to give her a chance to spotlight that as, as a resource for this hub. Thanks, Dan. It's um, great to hear the exchange among different organizations here and um, great points raised so far. And I think what I'll present from CRS, Catholic Relief Services Resources, is more in terms of um, how we're encouraging programs to adapt their current meal systems um, to the COVID response by, first of all, encouraging teams to um, reduce what they can, so this has come up in other presentations, but to reduce um, what meal, to reduce down to necessary, although we already want it to be minimal, of course, but to reduce the meal activities that need to be done, to adapt those, um, and then to kind of to the second question, repurpose the, um, the role of meal to help inform how those overall interventions should be adapted. What I'd like to do sort of to walk through that a bit is to share my screen. I haven't shared screen much in um, Zoom, so bear with me as I get just the right thing up. Let's see, so. Um, what you'll see here is the link that I just dropped into the chat box. And this has an array of resources for partners related to COVID-19 response and um, the first one that I'd like to highlight is the, the resource specifically on um, meal for partners. So as, as I mentioned, the first kind of the first message that comes across is, you know, can we postpone, can we cancel this activity? If not, this guidance provides principles on how to make it safe. Um, certainly avoiding groups or adjusting groups is needed. Um, wanting to rely on ICT for D or meal as that's come up, and then maintaining clear communication as is feasible in context. A couple of aspects here that I think are worth further highlighting is that while we're trying to, let's say, CRS has been investing in greater use of ICT for D in meal activities for a long time now, but we uh, sort of in learning from that, have recognized that that's not always accessible to the more vulnerable populations. So in this guidance document, there are some ideas or um, some prompts to think about how to balance sort of greater use on ICT for D with wanting to make sure that more vulnerable community members are still able to um, engage and to participate in communication as we use ICT for, um, ICT for D for communication as well. Um, uh, this guidance that's presented here also really encourages teams to keep up on the latest from WHO, the latest from um, local governments, 
So this is intended to be an evolving document, kind of an encouraged teams to weave together the latest information from different resources um, while the, our headquarters team continues to update this document to reflect changes in context. As we see down below, there is then, let's see, we have some principles here. Um, understanding restrictions in terms of context, and then some really practical ideas in terms of what to do instead of. So instead of household data collection, is it possible to rely on more ICT for D approaches? Um, is it possible to, if household visits are safe household visits, are planned for other project implementation activities? Can we consolidate so that one safe do no harm visit covers multiple purposes, including meal? Um, can we make do with a smaller sample size? So if a meal activity is deemed necessary, how can it be reduced um, as much as possible? And then we also focus here on the use of meal data. So how can we adjust our meetings with partner staff so that we're still able to use and reflect on data together during, um, during this, um, during COVID-19 programming? I appreciated the suggestions earlier to, in a sense, kind of expand the use of feedback and response mechanisms to make sure we're balancing accountability and learning while we're able to do less monitoring. So here the suggestions are um, really to rely more on ICT for D in terms of feedback and response, noting that um, that needs to be balanced as possible for vulnerable groups. And then there are ideas here in terms of asking community members to send photos if observation was part of the meal system. So this table is kind of, a, if you will, a cheat sheet to prompt teams to think about how they can adapt what we've deemed to be a necessary meal activity. Um, there's also some, some suggestions here for if this is a new project, if it's a, if it's a response to COVID-19 itself, some principles that we're putting forward um, in terms of how to develop a meal system for COVID-19 um, responses themselves. And here, if anything, it's kind of highlighting what's coming in terms of you know, different donors such as OFCA are probably developing standard indicators that can be used. So at this point, we're sharing out principles, but noting that there's more that will be developed in that regard. Another document I'd like to highlight as well, which I think really sets, uh, that isn't it, my apologies, which really sets the tone for, for how we'd like to approach a meal in um, existing programming and also COVID-19 programming is just to put frame meal with as, as the overall program would be within um, our local leadership initiatives. So a lot of the ideas shared in this document kind of reiterate um, the tone and the environment in which we want meal to contribute to program quality and appropriateness. So in terms of you know, emphasizing communication, making sure communication is clear, really getting kind of local partner insights to drive and develop meal systems and responses overall, um, and to make sure that community voice is part of those more local decisions. So this document, I think, is also really worth a read in terms of that kind of larger vision and context it sets for perhaps the more, oops, the more specific considerations and ideas in our meal um, for COVID-19 programming document. So that's a quick overview, and I would encourage you to take a look at the, the link I sent in the chat box, which posts these two documents as well as others. This is certainly um, going to be a changing and evolving site, and I know that for the meal document, we have a newer version that should be ready in just a couple of days. But a big, I guess, a big thing for us at, at CRS is trying to make sure that we are integrating our documents so our, you know, we have different sectoral guidance documents that are coming out. We have guidance from our humanitarian response department and otherwise. And a big commitment for us is to make sure that we're consolidating and weaving these documents together so that these updates are as digestible for teams as possible during these times. So stay tuned on this site and I hope there'll be um, something of interest for folks. I'd be really interested in questions as well as suggestions on um, what new versions could include. Thank you. Yes, thank you. I think you see in the chat just an appreciation for these rich resources that your team has prepared and have shared. So thank you for being willing to highlight those. We have a few minutes here if there are any, any questions for Clara. Uh, hi. Uh... Thank you, Clara. This is very inspiring. And 
uh, this give us a really good idea and on the next step at Islamic Relief to document it. I just want to ask what is the process of uh, approving this? Was this like a technical guideline that you set up or was this something that was approved at the level of uh, senior leadership or the board? I, I want to know the process of approving it. Great question. So um, I'd say this initiative has been led by our meal director. So in terms of larger approval for the meal guidance itself, I don't know of an approval as much as that our meal director, um, Tony Castleman has been really driving this effort and making sure that um, the additions are coming through him so it's consolidated and coordinated. What we've developed to complement this is a, a simple Excel spreadsheet, which is kind of a, a compendium of all the smaller resources on Oh gosh, how to do focus groups when, or consolidating, I should say, a lot of external resources because there are many these days um, linked to specific meal activities. So in addition to this, we've had an effort to consolidate and keep current and keep concise um, all of the external documents that can help with specific meal pieces. So in terms of um, approval, I don't know that it's that so much as just a really close eye on how to manage the constant um, evolution of not only the context, but the new guidance that's coming up. So that's been a big push for us to make sure everything's integrated in one place. Thus the development of that um, site on the ICS link that I sent. And there's also, I think, an internal site for CRS staff where we're trying to keep everything consolidated and updated. I hope that answers your question. So it isn't, wasn't approval as much as it's just making sure we're really centralizing the development and updating of these documents to avoid confusion. Uh, Clara, what was the name of the second document that you shared? Good question, let's see. And the second document um, is named COVID-19 and the critical need to support local leadership. Can put that in the chat box and I'm very glad to send these documents with PDF afterwards. My apologies that um, that it isn't coming up for some folks. Oops. Thanks. All right, I believe we have time for, for one more question or comment um, before, before we wrap up. So I, if, if there's a, a burning question, I, I invite it now. Dan, can I ask a question? Please, Jonathan. Hi, um, my question is to CRS. Uh, with those guidelines just to the organization um, or does CRS also have implementing partners um, and if so, are those guidelines also to them as well? And if so, how did you then communicate it? Yeah, great point. So CRS um, um, primarily implements through local partners, implementing partners. So this ICS site is for um, institutional capacity strengthening for those partners and hosts a range of learning capacity strengthening um, resources for those partners. So this is a long-standing site that's been in place as part of our um, big focus and commitment to capacity strengthening. Great, thanks, Clara. Well, uh, as we, we come to the close of our hour, I wanna respect people's time, but I do wanna just point you all at, as has been shared in the, the chat by Olivia, um, the JLI's monitoring evaluation accountability and learning hub site is going to be the place where this presentation will be recorded and as organizations are willing to submit some of the things that they're working on including uh, the presentation shared today um, that is going to be a place where you can go and find find these resources and so I know we didn't have time for every organization to be able to share. I'm sure there are more rich resources that are worth sharing and learning from, from one another. And so uh, if you are willing, please 
send those to us uh, and so that we can uh, post those to the hub website and and share those with this community and I would also just uh, uh, put out a, a brief reminder that again the the normal purpose of this this hub uh, has been focused on how meal can be best done in collaboration with local faith actors. And so there still is a call for case studies out. Um, and so I, that may not feel like your, your team's most urgent priority in this season, but uh, you may also find yourself with some additional time. And so uh, we would certainly invite you to be begin or continue submitting those, those case studies of good practices of how to conduct meal uh, in collaboration with local faith actors. And so the, the last thing that I, I would like to say, if, if I may be so bold uh, at the end of this, uh, this call is, I, one of the things that I appreciate about this learning community is that uh, it is the joint learning initiatives uh, on, on faith. Uh, and uh, I, uh, that is a uniting factor for this community. And yes, we come from many different faiths, but I think what is uniting this community is that we are people of faith. And that also means that we are, we are people of prayer. And I would just love to encourage you all um, that this is, this is a time in this world where um, people of prayer need to be just that. And so I would en encourage you all to, to continue to lean into your faith, to lean into uh, being people of prayer in this time. And so thank you all for, for joining this, this webinar. Thank you all for those that have presented for sharing generously from your organization's experience. And uh, just uh, uh, thank you for joining. And so that'll, that'll be it for our hub this meeting. Uh, we will be joining again in one month. Uh, and so you can be on the lookout for that invitation as well. So have a wonderful rest of your, your mornings, afternoons, evenings, or late nights as the case may be.